be arrogance versus humility, but because of the bastardization of arrogance and humility in the English language. And even back when Moses was around, they called Moses the most arrogant man on earth when actually he was the most humble. We're going to have to understand exactly what it means to be arrogant and to be humble. So we're going to call this subjective thinking versus objective thinking. So you can put that on the top of your notes. You can write notes. You don't have to look at me all the time. And in order for us to have objective thinking, the next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to, to utilize 1 John 1, 9, which states, If you name your sins, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive you those sins and to purify you, katharizo, from all wrongdoing, which is adakia. With this in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to utilize our time in worship of you. And we worship you by taking in your word. Therefore, may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we may take these things that we note this morning and that they may be a challenge and a blessing to us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So what does it mean to be subjective? Well, that one's almost self-explanatory. Subject. Subjective. You are the subject. You could say, I, the subject, feel bad. You are talking about yourself. That is subjective. That's not sinful. So we're going to have to delve in this farther and get a definition of subjective thinking. So write down this definition. We will define subjective thinking as perceiving from or taking place in a person's mind totally apart from reality. Subjective thinking is perceiving from or taking place in a person's mind totally apart from reality. Objective thinking is to think in terms of reality. Objective thinking is to think in terms of reality. There are two categories of people who experience both subjective and objective thinking, both believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers can think objectively. The unbeliever can experience subjective thinking on a limited basis simply by understanding and abiding by the establishment principles that have been set up by God. An unbeliever can orient himself to authority. This will give the unbeliever orientation to life and to happiness. While the unbeliever's happiness does depend upon circumstances, the unbeliever's environment and circumstances are improved simply by his adherence to the establishment principles. Establishment principles include marriage, family, free enterprise. In other words, an unbeliever could be happy where he works under the authority of his boss, etc. Unbelievers can also experience patriotism. Many have died on battlefields in service to their country and then went to hell. But they died in service to their country and experienced patriotism and had orientation to authority. And they went to hell not because Christ rejected them, but because they rejected Christ. We are going to focus on the believer, however, since all of us here are believers. The believer can experience objective thinking on a much higher plane than the unbeliever. While the unbeliever must orient to authority of establishment, the believer that is, the believer can take this further by adhering to the greatest objective reality ever, Bible doctrine, the Word of God. The more metabolized Bible doctrine a believer has circulating in his stream of consciousness, the believer will be less motivated to live by subjective thinking and experience plus H, a happiness not determined by circumstances, because the objective thinker is thinking about an object, and that object is Bible doctrine. An objective thinker does not consistently and constantly think of life in terms of self, 
Rather, an objective thinker thinks of life in terms of principle. And for the believer, the objective thinker thinks of life in terms of spiritual principles that are phenomenal. King David is an example of a believer whose thinking was based in the objective reality of Bible doctrine. You can see this by reading Psalm 1-1 where David said, On thy word I meditate both day and night. In other words, David concentrated on the objective reality of the word of God, excluding his own desires, and he had many. His own talents, he was a super genius. His own ambitions, he was occupied with doctrine the very doctrine that existed before time itself has existed. For 1 John 1, 1 states, In the beginning, which was not a beginning, was the Word. Therefore, objective reality has always existed and will always exist. And it is our responsibility as believers to metabolize the Word of God so that we can always call on objective reality whenever we're tempted to think subjectively. What does this mean? to think subjectively. Whenever we are attempted to think about ourselves and associate everything in life with how we feel, how we act, how people treat us, how much talent we have, how many abilities we have, none of these things matter when it comes to the spiritual life. Don't you know that God gives you your very next breath. If you think you're smart and intelligent and you and your approbation lust want to make others think you're smart and intelligent, God can smite you with anything that can debilitate you. God makes war on the arrogant believer. He might give you mad cow disease. One minute you're intelligent, the next minute you're frothing at the mouth and mooing. No, you don't move. But you do go crazy. One minute, you'll be a genius. The next, you may be an idiot. But this is God's prerogative because He gives you your very next breath. You do not breathe on your own accord and whatever intelligence you have has been given to you by God. It's nothing for us to brag about. In our, subject, in our study, subject thinking will be tantamount to arrogance. This arrogance can be very subtle and it may not be seen by others at all. The person involved can be unaware that he or she is arrogant. There is obvious arrogance, of course, but a person involved in subjective thinking may appear to be humble. A person with an inferiority complex may appear to be humble, but in actuality, they're arrogant. Because a person with an inferiority complex looks around at other people and says, they think of me as inferior. But in the soul of an inferiority complex, they say, I am superior. Others should not look at me in this inferior manner. This is arrogance. And the believer who has reached spiritual self-esteem should throw the inferiority complex out the window. I know this much about subjective thinking. All of us have been involved in it, and I know why. Because at the age of two or three, as soon as we learn the words I and me, and I want and me want, because some children use me instead of I, they are thinking subjectively. And it's not the child's fault. They're born with a sin nature. It was Adam's fault. And they look through the prism of their own thoughts in subjectivity. That's why when you play peekaboo with a child, the child laughs. Do you know why he's laughing? Because when a child looks behind and peeks down and then you look, when you disappear, the child imagines that you have vanished. In his own subjective thinking, he thinks you've disappeared. This is not reality. The reality is you have gone behind a wall, but a child does not have the capability to think objectively. It is absolutely incapable for a child to think objectively and therefore God has set up a system for all of us to grow up and learn how to be subject, ob objective. And that perfect system is enforced humility which 
for children is a spanking. And depending, depending on the volition of the child, this is their first step toward objective thinking. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 6, 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may go well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Do you notice what is omitted from this verse purposely? Does the verse command the child to love his parents? Of course not. A child is incapable of love. Michael Jackson. If you give a child what he wants, the child will love you. He will love you not on the basis of objectivity, but on the basis of subjectivity. He likes what he's getting from you, therefore he likes you. Not because of you, you dummy, but because of what you've given him. So what is it that a parent should want from a child? Is it love no, it's obedience. Obedience is the only way a child can learn to be objective. Obedience is the only way a child can learn respect. You'll tell your child to stop doing something, but your child has learned a vocabulary word, no. And the child will say no. And why? Because a child is naturally subjective. They are the subject and if the subject wants to do something, the subject will. Therefore, because he has the desire to continue to disobey your authority, he will continue to do so unless you enforce humility with a paddling on the butt. And the pain will move from the butt up the spinal cord and register with the brain. And the child begins to think. This is the first step toward objective thinking. Why did Jesus say, Suffer not the little children unto me? It's a very simple re reason. A child in a normal household is under enforced humility. A child under enforced humility is often more receptive to the gospel of Christ than an adult who may have hardened his heart through years of subjective, arrogant thinking. So how does all of this apply to us and our spiritual life? Well, think for a moment about when was the first time, as a believer, you thought objectively. First, you believed in Christ. Then, very shortly after salvation, after you made that fateful choice to believe in Christ, you will commit a sin. And we know this to be true because of 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10. You can look those up later. After we sin, we are no longer in the bottom circle, but we have moved to the top circle called carnality. You are out of fellowship with God. So what is the first act of objective thinking that a Christian must make? You must name your sins to God. We learn that in 1 John 1, 9. Did you know that naming your sin to God was an act of humility? The reason why the people in the United States of America are constantly concerned about foreign attack, whether it be terrorist or otherwise, is because there is an overwhelming majority of born-again believers in this country who do not have the humility to simply name their sins to God. Do you see how much humility this takes? You have to admit that you're wrong. When a subjective thinker commits a sin, that subjective thinker will justify it. If a subjective thinker is fired from a job due to his own bad behavior, the subjective thinker will blame everyone else except himself. It is difficult for the arrogant to admit when they are wrong. It is difficult for the arrogant believer to name his sins to God because by doing so, he is admitting that he has done wrong. It takes humility to rebound. This is the problem in Christianity today. Far too many Christians are too arrogant to simply rebound. And because of this apostasy, 
even a believer who admits that he is wrong will refuse to follow the simple procedure of 1 John 1 9 because in his own subjectivity he believes that he can gain God's approval and God's fellowship by what he or she does to make up for that sin. This is subjective thinking. Objective thinking follows a procedure and that procedure is simple yet it is unbearable for the arrogant Christian to do so. God forgives on the basis of what Christ did on the cross. God does not forgive on the basis of what you do. That is subjective. Do you see now how the arrogant person is always thinking about himself? And it is impossible for them to utilize the simple procedure of 1 John 1 9, which states, If you name your sin to God, name comes from homologeo, 5th century BC Athens word, where they, in a court of law, the criminal would get up and say, I am guilty of thus and so. It's the same concept in Christianity. You go to God and you say, I have done this. That's it. You don't ask God to forgive you even. You just name the sin. You say, I have committed whatever you've committed. Name your sins. Then God, the Father, is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to purify you from all wrongdoing. So the first act of humility in the spiritual life is to utilize rebound. And if you do not, you will intensify your subjective thinking and you will begin to spin on the cogwheels of the arrogant skills in three categories. Number one, you will justify yourself, self-justification. Number two, you will deceive yourself, self-deception. And number three, there is self-absorption. You justify your sin because you say, I have a right to be angry. Look what that person did to me. That's self-justification. You don't have a right to be angry. No one does. Objective thinking thinks in reality and says anger is a sin no matter what has happened to me. Objective reality rebounds when one is angry. And that verse is be angry and sin not is not the verse. It's being angry and stop sinning. Rebound. Self-deception is when you deceive yourself into thinking that you actually did nothing wrong and you actually believe this and this is where you start to get into locked in arrogance because you cannot see yourself as you are it's if you're splattered with dung and you can't even smell yourself number three self-absorption you're totally occupied with yourself and incapable of thinking objectively and these arrogant skills prolonged over a long period of time will result in double-minded believers or psychosis. And this nation is filled with them. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14. It's Old Testament. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will restore their land. Notice the first verb in there. The people must do what? They must humble themselves. Before what? before they pray and seek the face because they're going in prayer to rebound. That's their first act of humility. Actually, they may have done that act several times, but it is the first act of humility in the Christian way of life. You must humble yourself. It means you're about to admit you've done wrong. So you go in prayer and rebound to God. That is, turning from their wicked ways. That is the rebound 
And this is what believers in this country must do if our land is to be restored and we are not to go under the fifth cycle. This must occur. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ must humble themselves by realizing that God's procedure is the only right procedure, and that is to name their sins to God. This way, the believers will stop their subjective thinking and come to the objective reality of the Word of God simply by naming their sins to God. Then God will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and restore their land. We need in this country more than anything else believers to learn and utilize the procedure of rebound. And then this nation will prosper if these believers grow up as it has never prospered before. But in the meantime, most believers reject rebound because of subjective thinking, because of arrogance. Let's take a look at one of the greatest objective thinkers of all time. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 23.2. Acts 23.2. It's right after Romans. Here, we are going to read about Paul and learn about how objective people think in terms of principle and not in terms of subjectivity. It reads like this, And the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike the apostle Paul on the mouth. Then the apostle Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall, Do you sit to try me according to the law, but in violation of the law order me to be struck? You see here that Paul condemns the actions of Ananias on the basis of principle and truth. The legalist, Ananias, thinks he is a master of the law. But the Apostle Paul can see hypocrisy. And he points out this hypocrisy by saying, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit and try me according to the law, but in violation of this law, you order me to be struck. The Apostle Paul just said something extremely witty, and it threw this man off guard. Just imagine, you you are a judge, you are an administrator of the law, and he points out to you that you are in violation of the law. And Paul was in right thinking. He was confident in the fact that God would repay Ananias. And you notice Paul's ability to leave it in the Lord's hands, knowing that God will strike Ananias. Paul did not have to do anything. He made room for the Lord. For vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. But then as we continue, we see that all the legalistic bystanders who were watching this said to Paul, Do you revile God's high priest? Young people today would say, Are you dissing the high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was a high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. What happened here? Is Paul wimping out? No, Paul would never wimp out. Paul was courageous. This is an example of genuine humility. This is an example of objective thinking. Even though the ruler Ananias is out of line, tyrannical, self-righteous, hypocritical, the Apostle Paul completely submits himself to him, not because of who and what Ananias is, the ruler, but based solely on Paul's objective thinking. He could not deny the authority of a ruler, whether the ruler be good or evil. This is humility. So now it's time to have some points of application. If you're slack on the job when you can get away with it, or because your boss is a jackass, you are a subjective thinker and arrogant. If you perform poorly on a job because you think you deserve better, you are a subjective thinker. If you do your job as unto the Lord, whether your boss is present or whether your boss is a butt, You are an objective thinker. You are thinking in terms of reality. And what is this reality? The reality is authority. Authority orientation means right thinking. 
Authority orientation means making right decisions. Look at Ephesians 6, 5. Ephesians 6, 5. It says, Slaves, which means employees nowadays, Employees, be obedient to them that according to the flesh are your master, with respect and eagerness to do your job with single-mindedness from your stream of consciousness as unto Christ, not in the way of eye service as men-pleasers, that would be brown-nosers, who go to the boss and please them in front of them and then talk badly behind their back about them. This is eye service, men-pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the stream of consciousness, with, do, with good will, doing services unto the Lord and not unto men. Take a look at verse 5 where it says, To do your job with single-mindedness. I don't know what your Bible says. It might say sincerity, but that's not a good translation. Sincerity has no meaning. So what does it mean to be single-minded? It's simple. It means you're not double-minded. You're not daisukas. In other words, to be single-minded is to live your life on the basis of principle, not flopping from one train of thought to another like a tumbleweed in a desert being pushed around by the fickle wind. Rejection of authority breeds double-mindedness. Rejection of authority, subjective thinking, and all-around arrogance prolonged will eventuate in mental illness. And if you are mentally ill, don't feel ashamed. You're still alive. God still has a purpose for your life. There are medicines, wonderful medicines, that can help you think objectively. And if you're positive toward doctrine, many times you can recover from the mental ill state. Some people do recover from this state. Others do not. And that oftentimes leads to permanent psychosis because of rejection of authority. There are other psychiatric symptoms that occur that have nothing to do with your lifestyle. They're simply a degenerative brain disease or something else that happens biologically that has nothing to do. But the overwhelming majority of psychotic believers is because of rejection of authority. Now we're going to have another application. Wives. If you say you cannot obey your husband because he is a fool, a drunk, negative toward doctrine, or just an overall but, then you are involved in subjectivity. Your thinking is distorted, and you are not thinking in terms of reality, much less true wisdom. In fact, you're thinking of yourself in terms of arrogance, even though this is subtle and oftentimes excused. You have placed yourself, your ideas, your life, the way you would like your husband to be, over the Word of God itself. Turn to 1 Peter 3 1. 1 Peter 3 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, that's negative volition toward doctrine, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your virtuous and respectful behavior. What is the greatest virtue in life? Do you know? The greatest Christian virtue is humility. If you do not have the humility to obey your husband, to respect your husband, to be submissive to your own husband, even when he is being a butt, you do not have the humility to learn the Word of God, and you will be a loser unless you humble yourself. Listen, you are not the only ones under authority. We're all under authority. All of us may have points where we dislike our boss, but we still must respect the authority of that boss or suffer the consequences. You may hate your husband, but you must respect his authority or suffer the consequences. This might be difficult to understand, but that's because our culture has a system of thinking that is completely subjective. Little girls grow up 
under this subjective thinking and this subjective thinking is encouraged and if you don't think subjectively the other ladies will look at you like a fool but God has created this authority not just for the hell of it he's done it because authority will give you freedom you've heard the colonel say freedom without authority is anarchy and authority without freedom is tyranny if you do not stay under the authority of your husband no matter what a fool he may be then your soul is in anarchy and you have no freedom if your husband beats you however and is a stupid wife beater you have the obligation to leave the situation do not take physical abuse of course but outside of this you must do as the Word of God states and that takes humility look what it says in first Peter 3 1 it says that even a husband who is negative toward Bible doctrine may go positive how is he gonna go positive if you nag him to go to church with you is he gonna go positive if you nag him concerning some of the things he does that you don't like no men will not submit to nagging and they should not so what does the verse says it says that they may be won over without a word that doesn't mean you should play the silent treatment game this means that when it comes to those things that irritate you concerning your husband remain silent and respectful do not say a word understanding a man is simple show your husband respect and your marriage will improve not necessarily because the man is arrogant even though that can be true but simply because that's the way God designed men in order to have objective thinking therefore all of us must submit to the authority of God and the plan of God is revealed to us through the pages of Scripture the progress of a believer's spiritual life whether it be rapid slow or spinning toward earth depends upon the degree to which you organize your life around one simple principle the principle of authority submit to the police officer submit to your boss submit to Uncle Sam submit to your teacher your coach for if you reject any institutional authority you are rejecting the very authority of God Almighty therefore humility is one of the main keys to your spiritual life for who in history always thought objectively who was it who always submitted to authority who was it that practiced the greatest humility ever known the Lord Jesus Christ turn in your Bibles to Philippians 1 5 have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself what does this mean this means that there was absolutely no subjective thinking on this on his part this means he took himself out of the equation and made the authority of God the Father the object of his thinking hence objective thinking continuing taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross it was the humility of Jesus Christ that has brought all of us salvation if Christ had not been humble we would not be saved this ends the introduction bow your heads and close your eyes thank you father for the opportunity this morning to feed upon your word to take your word and convert gnosis into epinosis may God the Holy Spirit challenge us by what we have learned challenge us to have this attitude in ourselves that was also in Christ Jesus the attitude of humility the modus operandi of objective thinking 
And may we learn to recognize when we are thinking subjectively and from a viewpoint of arrogance. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.